Bruchem Aboyim. We are now in our series on the Haggadah. We are up to lecture number 10. Uh, last week when we met, we stopped at the uh, sixth plague, the one of Barad, which is hail, and we dealt with the first five. Now, with the plague of Barad, uh, it was in a uh, miraculous plague by itself and the fact that the, the hail was not just hail, it was hail with fire on the inside. So you had uh, ice and inside fire, again, two opposites. And this is why, again, one of the reasons why God, again, with all the plagues, showed his control over nature. Now, Moshe Benu uh, told Paro, as we know in Shemos, this time I am sending all my plagues. And Rashi comments from here that we learn that the plague of the firstborn was equal to all the plagues. However, it's interesting, Moshe Benu was about to bring the plague of hail. So why does Rashi say the plague of the firstborn? should say the plague of hail. So in the eyes of Paro, that Makos uh, Barad, the plague of hail, was the worst. But to the people, pardon me, to Paro, that's the opposite, Makos Bechoros, the plague of the firstborn was the worst. Uh, but to the people, hail was the worst plague because it destroyed all the food based on a shach. Uh, so again, the firstborn just would have affected the firstborn, even everybody lost someone. But the plague of destroying all the food, everyone was affected with, again, complete famine. The Zerapunim states that Rashi used an abbreviation, Mem Beis in Hebrew, which also would be Makos Barod. But the printer wrote the plague as Makos Bechoros. So he wrote it out incorrectly. We have that in certain places where abbreviations were used or there was a printer's error. Some say that was the same case with uh, the, uh, the laws of Moshe Minu taught at Mara where he taught the, la the laws of Pura Duma, the, of the red heifer. And some say that it really had no bearing, that what he really taught was the laws of Kibirov, of honoring parents, which makes sense. So again, we see this time and again. Um, also, God had, has three legions that he uses to punish sinners. They are fire, water, and wind. Where do we see this? Sodom was punished with fire. The generation of the flood, of course, with water. And the generation of dispersion, so to speak, with wind, in that they were dispersed throughout the world. However, Barad included all three of them. Now, the integration of fire and water during this plague demonstrates a spiritual integration of kindness, which is the spiritual antecedent of water, and judgment, which is the spiritual antecedent of fire based on a Moscow of David. Also, this was the only plague in which God provided the Egyptians a means to escape by staying in their houses. They were warned that if they stayed in, that they would not be affected. Also, this was the only, again, because basically the plague was there to destroy the crops. It was not there to, meant to hurt them. This was also the only plague in which God conveyed to Paro through Moshe Benu the precise moment when the plague would begin based on the Rebbe's Passover Haggadah. Now, Barad also, the Moshe Benu prayed outside the city since the Egyptians had brought their sheep into the city and we know that they worshipped the side of Ares, which was the sheep. So, so instead of leaving them in the field, the people brought them in to protect them. And therefore Moshe Benu, when he prayed for God, did not want to pray in the city since all their idols were in the city. So he went out into the field even though the hail was falling and Moshe Benu was not affected by it. Again, nor were the Jews. And we'll talk about something about that in a minute. Continues with the plague of Arbe, which were the locust. And again, this started a new, a new series, just like with the Tochachas, uh, which are loosely called the curses. They come in series of seven, which is like the natural order of the world. And then the next seven would be worse. So, so too here. There were seven plagues, and now the locust begins the next seven, and all of these had some representation of death. Uh, with the locusts, they were so thick, people couldn't breathe. So they were suffocating with it. The Choshek darkness, we know that again, that darkness was so thick again that they could barely breathe and they couldn't move. So it was as if they were dead. And of course, Makos Bechoros, the killing of the firstborn, which was actual death. Now, the Arba, the Torah in Shemos repeats the entire land of Egypt. And then again, 
in the entire border of Egypt. So this thing is repeated twice. The question is why? To say that even though the nation of Israel were not hurt by the plagues, the locusts ate all the vegetation, even in Goshen, so that the Egyptians now had absolutely no food. And the nation of Israel went into the desert with only the matzah that they carried on their shoulders, a true expression of faith. Basically, when your children will ask you. And this becomes the real faith that they had. There was nothing to take because the Egyptians would have taken the food from the Jews if they had it. The Jews had no food. It says every Jew left Egypt with 90 donkeys laden with riches, but no food. And it showed the great faith that they had to go out into a wilderness with no provisions. Uh, the miracle was, again, that this masa would last 30 days. In fact, there's an interesting lesson that's learned. Uh, that 30 days trans was a transfer from one domain to another. Um, Whenever you go on a diet, if you change your diet quickly, even if it's a healthy diet, and you do it just auto immediately, many times your, your system, your digestive tract will rebel, and you'll have, you'll have digestive problems. If a person's going to change your diet, you do it gradually, and from one to the other, and then you accompany, you, you accustom your body to what you're doing. Same thing with the mun. At first they went from this matzah that lasted 30 days to the mun, which was spiritual food. And then when they, at the end of the 40 years, the mun fell and lasted 30 days and took them from that into regular food. And again, it's a good lesson. As we always say, the Torah is always an instruction manual on how a person should uh, deal with his life on a very natural basis. Now, so the, the um, next plague was the choshech. Uh, again, and by the way, Paro was very concerned about the Arba also. One of his concerns were that it, uh, it says they ate up the, the, eye, the eye of the earth in the sense that you couldn't, they couldn't even see the, the, uh, couldn't see the earth that they were so thick. It says that a blind person is never sated because he can't see his food. And so too, it was so thick that if you can't see, you just keep eating. There's no, there's no sating someone who can't see. And also the, power, the, the problem Paro had with the locusts, he was afraid if they stayed around that they would lay eggs. And once they would do that, the plague would never end. And that's another reason why he wanted them gone right away. The, um, what they did, which is interesting, uh, even though the laws of kosher, um, there are a type of locusts that are kosher. Uh, we don't know what they are, so therefore it's not something that we deal with. But the Egyptians uh, evidently did eat locusts, and they pickled them. So when it came time for the, when the plague ended, they had pickled some of the locusts for themselves for food. And miraculously, when the locusts left, there were no locusts left anywhere, not even in jars, that every, every one of the locusts were gone. The last of the nine plagues was the Choshech, which is darkness. It was the only plague that lasted six days rather than seven. Every one of the plagues lasted for seven days. And this plague of darkness was broken up into two parts. One part, first three days where it was dark, but the Egyptians could move around. But light, even if they lit a light, it didn't give them any light whatsoever. The last three days, wherever they were, they were stuck. The, the, the darkness was like, had a tangibility to it where they couldn't move. And for three days, they were stuck in their place. The Jews were then able to enter the houses of the Egyptians during those three days and see wherever their treasures were, wherever they had. So when they went left, they, were able to, they knew exactly what the Egyptians were going to give them. Um, and it's interesting, they didn't leave during the six days of darkness, which made the Egyptians think that if they wanted to run away, they would. And that's why some thought, again, they were going out just temporarily. Now, what's interesting, though, is that why only six days? The seventh day came when the nation of Israel camped at the sea, the Red Sea. And that was the seventh day of Passover, Pesach. And it protected the nation of Israel from the Egyptians. That on one side, it was dark for the Egyptians. And on the other side, there was the, there was the fire that gave light and heat to the Jews. And as the, the two armies were next to each other, the Egyptians shot spears and arrows and catapults into the camp of the Israelites, but they didn't, weren't, weren't able to penetrate the cloud. I always laugh, everything that goes around comes around, much like the Iron Dome. They could have called it the clouds of glory, and they were much better what God does 
Iron Dome just took about 90% of the missiles. These took 100%. So the cloud did not allow any object to uh, pierce through the cloud to hurt the Jews. Now, the last of the plagues, again, was Makos Bukharis, the killing of the firstborn. Now, God did not take away Paro's free will for the last five plagues, uh, but it does say that he hardened Paro's heart. But rather, he, what he did is he gave Paro the strength to continue on the course that he had chosen, even in the face of the mounting pressure of the plagues. So it's not that he forced Paro to do it. He just exposed Paro's true will. God did not want Paro to give in because of the pressure of the plagues. He wanted Paro to concede to the fact that there's only one God in the world. And that becomes the important thing. So Paro, even during the last five plagues, still could have done tshuva, still could have repented and acknowledged the fact that there was a God in the world. Now, when it comes to the uh, Makos Bukharos, the killing of the firstborn, now, why does it say every other one of the plagues is one word? Dam, Tzvardeya. Makos Bukharos is two words. So the question is why? Number one is because the, the firstborn revolted against their parents and caused a civil war which killed many Egyptians. So Makos Bukharos was really the, the rebellion, the civil war of the, against their parents. So Makos was the smiting of the firstborn in the civil war that occurred. So that's one reason. Um, also, this is the only plague that has two words because one word does not describe um, the plague. That's this plague. The other plagues can be described by one word. If we called it only Makos, that wouldn't tell us anything. And we only called it Bukharos, firstborn, that wouldn't tell us. So it has to be, again, the smiting of the firstborn. And that's why both words are used in order to describe what we have here. Now, the Makos Bukharos happened at night. In fact, at midnight. So the question becomes, why, does God, why did God want the plague of the killing of the firstborn to occur at night? The answer is, that would be when all the Egyptians would be at home. That if, he had, if it had occurred during the day, many people would have been in the fields or at work, and the extent of the punishment would not have been really felt. It wouldn't have been that obvious. But since it occurred at night, there was not a single house where someone did not die. And this could only have been ascertained if everyone was at home based on Mamloes. So not only was it the killing of the firstborn, if there was not a firstborn in the house, then the eldest person in the house died. And as we know, that the Egyptians were very immoral. So therefore, um, there were people who didn't realize that they were firstborn. So both firstborn to mother and father. And therefore, when people died, they thought that this was just a a plague that would affect everyone, not just the firstborn. And that's, again, why the trepidation of the whole nation of wanting the Jews to leave. Now, Rabbi Yehuda continues in the Haggad and said, Rabbi Yehuda gave to these plagues um, simonim, signs, or a um, abbreviation. It's called the Tzak Adash Biachav. Ten words. And these allude to the uh, ten plagues. In fact, the yud ke vav ke, if you spell it out as yud, yud vav dalid, and, uh, and hey, 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 if you spell out the word yud ke vav ke, also has ten letters to it. When, when, when Paro said he didn't know who God was of the name of the yud ke vav ke, that's why he was punished again with ten plagues. Now, the tzaka dash biachab, that why the acronym? One is, it's easier to remember. The Gemara Basakim says that a person should teach his students as concisely as possible. It's a good lesson. It's a good way to learn things. If you have to memorize something, just make up a word, whether anyone understands it or not, as long as you have the first letter of every word that you have to remember. It becomes easier to remember whatever sentence or whatever information that you need. Again, so that's uh, one reason given by the Gemara Psachim. Also, the first three plagues were brought by Aaron using his staff. The second group was brought by Moshe Rabbeinu without his staff. And the third group were brought by Moshe Rabbeinu using his staff, based in the, on the heritage Halach, uh, Haggadah. Now, the Gematri of 501 is the same as the word Asher, which, which Paro said to Moshe Rabbeinu, who is God, Asher, that I should listen to his voice. 
So he said the word asher, which has a numerical value of 501, based on the al Kuchmoni, the same as the word asher. And also, it's interesting, Rabbi Yossi says that there were 50 plagues. Rabbi Eliezer says there were 200. Rabbi Kiva says 250. Altogether, there are 500. All brought by one, by the one and only God, is the, again, the numerical value of 501, the, the gematria of the word asher, again, that I should listen to his voice. Um, also, the first two plagues of each group came with a warning, and the third came without a warning, so they were broken up into groups of threes. And this, uh, again, became part of the reason as they're broken up into these three, three categories. Now, at this point, cups are refilled. Um, the wine, um, is again, everybody's cup is filled at the Seder. Now, it continues with the uh, three rabbis. It says, Rabbi Yossi Aglili asked the question, how do I know what, that the Egyptians were struck with ten plagues in Egypt, but fifty at the sea? It says, concerning the plagues in Egypt, the Torah states that the magician said to Paro, Etz Belokim, he, it's the finger of God. Whereof to see the Torah relates that Israel saw the great hand which God had laid upon the Egyptians and the people feared God and they believed in God and Moshe his servant. How many plagues did they receive with the finger? Ten. They conclude that they suffered ten plagues in Egypt when they were struck by the finger of God. They must have been made to suffer fifty plagues at the sea where they were stu stuck by, struck by the whole hand. Now, also when Paro said me, who is God, that I should show him any honor and listen to his voice. The word me, mem, is the numerical value of 40 and yud 10. Again, this alludes to the 50 plagues that Rabbi Yossi is talking about. And when we talk about this yod hagdol, this great hand, so again, some say against the hand of God, but others say this is the outstretched hand of Basia, Paro's daughter, when she miraculously was able to reach Moshe Beno's basket in the Nile basic in the Alka Benacha, which is important in that the some say that the basket was as much as 50 feet away, and yet she still reached for it. And miraculously, she was able to extend her hand and bring Moshe's basket in, which is a great lesson. A person should never think about what he can or can't do. God can make anything happen. There, there are parents, women, who have been able to lift cars off of children that, they, that should not have happened. There are many things that people do that they think they're not able to do. But the truth is, God, in fact, they tell a story of a rabbi where his sexton came and said that they had run out of oil and that the young men in, this, in his uh, school would not be able to study that night because there was no more oil left for the lamps. And, the, and, the, and this rabbi said to his sexton, what do we have? And the sexton said, we have vinegar. So he said, put vinegar into the lamps. And he who said oil can burn can make vinegar burn. And that night, the lamps burnt on vinegar. God can do whatever God wants to do. And it talks, it's interesting that here it talks about God, they, they believed in God, Umosha Abdo, and Moshe his servant. It's the only time in the Haggadah that Moshe's name is mentioned, based on Elias Haggadah. Haggadah. Which is very strange, because as we know, the Moshe Benu is the main character. Um, God argued with him for a week to take the Jews out of Egypt. And you would think that the whole Haggadah would be the repetition of Moshe, 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 just like the Torah is. So why isn't it that Moshe's name is mentioned again and again in the Haggadah? So the commentaries tell us that the first person who fulfilled the mitzvah of the Gadotolavincha, of telling your children about the story of going out of Egypt, was Moshe himself. Because the only, the first Seder that was really kept was the second year in the desert. First year they experienced it. Second year, and that was the only time in the desert, by the way, that they did celebrate and have a Seder until they entered the land of Israel. But at that Seder, everyone that was there with their children had experienced the redemption from Egypt. Except for Moshe's children. They were in Midian. They came after the Jews had come into the desert. That's when Yisrael brought them. So the first person to fulfill this mitzvah of telling their ch his children about the story of the going out of Egypt was Moshe himself. And we know that God complimented Moshe as being Ish Anamaod, the humblest of all people. And therefore, he purposely left his name out. 
and, was, and did not mention his name in the Haggadah. He just told them the story without making himself the main character. Now, continues with the uh, Rebbe Eliezer. Rebbe Eliezer says, again, how do we know that uh, every plague, the Holy One, blessed be he, inflicted upon the Egyptians in Egypt was equal to four plagues. Uh, for it's written, he sent upon them his fierce anger, wrath, fury, and trouble, a band of emissaries of, of evil. Since each plague in Egypt consisted of wrath, fury, trouble, and a band of emissaries of evil, therefore concludes in Egypt they were struck by 40 plagues, and to sea by 200. Now what's interesting is, as Rabbi Akiva says, continuing, how does one be derived that each plague, in, that the Holy One and blessed be he inflicted upon the Egyptians in Egypt was equal to five plagues, he says, for it's written, he sent upon them his fierce anger, wrath, fury, trouble, and the band of emissaries of evil. And since each plague in Egypt consisted of fierce anger, wrath, fury, trouble, and the band of emissaries of evil, therefore he concluded that in Egypt they were struck by 50 plagues, and at the sea, 250 plagues, five times as many. Now, so what's interesting is the question that's asked is why is it that Rabbi Eliezer sees the number as four, and Rabbi Akiva sees the number as five. And Rabbi Eliezer sees the plagues as a gesture of the kindness to the nation of Israel. And so he connects to the four-letter name of God of mercy, the yud ke vav -ke. That's why four. Whereas Rabbi Akiva sees the plagues as a form of punishment for the Egyptians. And so he connects them to the five-letter name of God of justice. Again, a lukim. And that's the reason why four versus five, and then one coming up to 200 and 250. Now, what difference really does it make? Why are these rabbis going back and forth of how many plagues there were in Egypt or how many at the sea? It's a moot point. The answer is that God promised the nation of Israel in the book of Shmos, any of the diseases that I placed upon Egypt, I will not bring upon you. So the greater number of plagues is a benefit to us because it means fewer ways for us to suffer based in Kiyimcha uh, ben Bencha. Also, the Haggadah states, mitzvah aleinu l'saper. The Gras says that it's a, it's a uh, good deed for us to talk about the story of the Haggadah, of the going out of Egypt. The Gras says the word is, is not l'saper, to, to te, we call, we tell, or we call, to tell our tell over or speak, but lispor, to count. And this is why the rabbis over here are counting, again, based on an explanation by barrel wine. Now, again, each plague was fourfold in nature, affecting earth, wind, fire, and water. And since each of the ten plagues violated the laws of nature, all four elements were altered with each plague. So each, ten, each one of the ten plagues really was four times that the number 40, based on Imam Lois. Now, at the end of um, Rabbi Akiva's statement, he said, So at the, at the, in Egypt they had 50 plagues, but on the sea there were 250. Now, why were there so many plagues at the sea? Why were there so many more plagues at the, pl at the sea than there were in Egypt? And it says the Egyptians had the merit in Egypt of giving the nation of Israel hospitality when they first invited them during the famine, when they invited Yaakov and his family to come down. In fact, the first nine plagues were really to give the Egyptians an opportunity to repent. It was only the last plague, plague that was punitive. And at the sea, they did not have the protection of this great mitzvah of Achnosus Orchem, of taking in guests to protect them, based on Elaine Le Shabbat. Also, this is the reason why, if you stop and think about it, the only plague that the nation of Israel had to be protected from uh, was by doing an action and acquiring some merit, was the plague of the firstborn. With all the other plagues, the Jews were able to walk around and not be affected by the plagues, not be hurt by them. Well, the reason being that since they too deserved to be punished, since they served idols also, as we know, that the sea complained to God, these are idol worshippers and these are idol worshippers. So why, what's the difference between them? In fact, if you look at the wording, 
the word choma, which is a wall, uh, spelled also without a vav, which is chama, in anger, that the sea wanted to drown the Jews at the same time. Now, the next part of the Haggadah deals with a very uh, famous prayer that we say. It's called the Dayenu. Most people sing it, and this tune seems to be universal. It begins with the word, Kama malus tovas tamakam aleinu. That uh, how, many, how many favors did God bestow upon us? Now, the Milt of Melio sees the individual enumeration of each step as an educational tool whereby we impress upon our children and ourselves a fuller realization of all that we receive from God, what we call hakoros hatov, gratitude, a central theme of, the, of Pesach. For example, Moshe Benu would not hit the water nor the earth, which is interesting because really the question becomes this concept of hakoros hatov, of gratitude, how far does it extend? Well, Moshe Benu was three months old when he was in the Nile. When he comes to perform the plagues to take the Jews out of Egypt, he's 80 years old. How long are you indebted to someone who does you a favor? So from Moshe we see it's eternal. 80 years later, he still will not hit the water, nor the land that buried the Egyptian. But if you stop and think, it goes further than that. What did the water do for him? In reality, the water just did what water did. It made his cradle float. It didn't do anything special for Moshe. It just did what its nature is to make things float. And yet, Moshe Bainu would not hit the sea, not hit the water. So we understand just how far gratitude goes for a Jew. In fact, the name that we're called by Yehuda, which is the word Jew, is the word Hoda, that when the, third, when the fourth son was born to Leah, she thanked God. And that's where the word Yehuda comes from that thanking of God for the goodness that, that she received more than her portion because she thought every one of the four wives of Yaakov would have three children. When she had the fourth, she saw she had special providence from God. Also, we see the dogs who didn't bark. The Torah says they're given in the veil of the dead carcass. That's not kosher, thrown to the dogs. And the donkeys that carried the wealth of the Jews out of Egypt. That it says every Jew had 90 donkeys carrying his wealth. Again, we do the mitzvah of Petra HaKamor, redeeming the firstborn donkey, the only unclean animal that has its firstborn redeemed. Again, again, this concept of HaKor Tov. Now, what's interesting are there are 15 dayenus, including the last paragraph, although some have an additional thanking for the coin Godel to atone for our sins. So 15 alludes to the name of God of the Yud, which is 10, and He, which is 5, which is Ka that the, he used to create, he used the Yud to create the upper worlds and the creation and He, the lower worlds. Now, since God did 15 favors for the nation of Israel in Egypt, they donated 15 different materials in the building of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. Again, a house for God. There were 15 generations from Abraham, Abram Avinu, to Shlomo Melech, King Solomon. It was called the full moon, so to speak, of the Jewish nation. There were 15 steps leading from the outer court of the temple to the inner court. King David, Governor Mela, composed 15 psalms from 120 to 134 that were sung by the Levites in praise of God during the rituals, during the sacrifice performed in the temple. They're called Shir Hamalos, the songs of ascent. There are also 15 stages from the Kiddush that we make at the, at the Seder until we receive Nirza, acceptance. God's acceptance of our Seder service based on Elias Agada. Also, there are 15 expressions, the praise and the prayer of Yishtabach. Again, it becomes part of the, with the word meaning praise that we say in the Haggadah and that we say every Shabbos and Yontav. In fact, it probably every day, of the, every day of the year. It's not just on holidays, it's also on weekdays. With the coming of Mashiach, the entire name of God, of mercy, will then be revealed. Um... I think what we're going to do is I think we'll stop here and then uh, next week we'll begin with the Dianus and we'll go through all of them and explain how it's possible that Diana, what's enough 
when it seems to be a little surprising because they all seem to be very important. And yet we say that if God had only done this, that would have been enough. We'll explain them all and get a better understanding of why this is such a special prayer. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbos.